This is The Wheel Weaves, a Wheel of Time podcast with no spoilers. This podcast is safe for first-time readers because it's made by a first-time reader. I'm your host, Annie, and I'm the one who's taken on the task of reading through this 15-book megaseries. I'm joined by my co-host, Brett, who's a longtime fan, and he's acting as my tour guide on this journey. This chapter, we're going to be talking about chapter 20, Dust on the Wind. Yeah, and I was going to start by saying this is a really awesome chapter, and I kind of feel bad because I'm pretty sure I've started every episode by With saying this, this is, is a, an awesome is a, chapter. <laughs> but I also don't feel bad because this is a great chapter. Yeah, I don't know why you'd feel bad about that. Well, it's because there's 20 chapters so far, and I've said they're all great. So, yeah. Yeah, they're well, all great. Well, that just shows what a dedicated fan you are. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, it's good. There's lots to talk about in this chapter. A lot of crazy things happen. Yeah, so I want to start off before we get into the chapter, obviously, with a fun fact for today. Okay, cool. Yeah, and this one is a little bit Wheel of Time adjacent, but it's all about Robert Jordan. Cool. So this one is really relevant. I pulled up an interview that he had in 2003, so quite a long time ago. And the reason why I brought this up is because the interviewer asks Robert Jordan a question and says, hey, you didn't start out writing fantasy. You started writing historical fiction. So... We talked a little bit about RJ's previous books he's written, and he did a lot of the Conan series, but he also did historical fiction. But the way Robert Jordan answers this is kind of a funny thing, so I'm going to paraphrase it for you. Okay, cool. So he says, the first thing I ever wrote was fantasy, at least he thought it was, because he had sent it to Daw Publishing, which is, I think, under the Penguin Books umbrella. Oh, yeah, okay. So, yeah, he had sent his very first piece, which was fantasy, and they accepted it. They made him offer for the book. And then he had sent back a letter asking for a couple changes in the contract. And then they sent back a, a pretty much a rejection letter because oh. they didn't want to change the contract. So he said, well, I still got a yes and a no. So I'm just going to go ahead and keep writing. Yeah. So he did. And then a little bit later on, that same book, he sent it to Ace Publishing. And they bought it as a science fiction novel. So it was both a fantasy novel under Daw and science fiction under Ace. And the interesting part is that neither actually ended up releasing this book to the public. Oh, it wasn't ever published. No, it wasn't. Because the new person who had replaced the person who originally bought it didn't like it. So they sent it back to him. So he got the rights back to it. Oh, okay. Yeah. So the inter- so he tells this little story. Then the interviewer asks, uh, and what was the name of the novel that we'll never see? And he says its title was The Warriors of Altai. Okay. And the reason why that's really exciting is because just this year, The Warriors of Altai was released. Oh, it was? Yeah. So Tor Publishing this year in 2019 released (laughs) this book that in this quote, RJ says, uh, its title was Warriors of the Altai and you will never see it or know anything about it. I have not destroyed the manuscript because it has powerful juju, but in my will, I have provisions that have that manuscript burned. But until that, I'm afraid to get rid of it, get rid of the juju that resides in it. Oh, so what happened? Well, so this book was basically kept in the closet for RJ's entire life. It was supposed to be destroyed. It was supposed to be destroyed, written in his will that is never going to be released. (laughs) And then I don't really know what happened, (laughs) but they decided that they were in fact going to release it. Okay, well, when we get our interview with... Harriet. Yeah, we're going to have to figure we're out gonna what happened. We're going to have to happened. ask her. That's a good one. Yeah, uh, as a side note, he also says in the same interview that that was the book that led him to meeting Harriet. Oh, cool. Yeah, so, it, and it also led him to getting his first published novel, uh, first novel published. So maybe there was something in that maybe. as to why it got published. But yeah, so this year. What year was that interview in? 2003. Oh, okay. Yeah, so that was Quite 16 years ago. Yeah. 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 So, and yeah. then that would have been his first book. That was the first book he ever, yeah. So that would have probably been what, the 60s, 70s? I honestly have no idea. I didn't oh. actually look up when he, <laughs> when it was originally written. But Okay, well that's your homework yeah, then. That, yeah, he said he didn't want to release it because he's such a better writer now. Yeah. So they're releasing something that he wrote like in the very first. So, you know, I yeah. haven't read it yet, but I, I would like to. So. Yeah, I bet. I was going to ask if you have it yet. It's on the list. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that is a good one. That's interesting, Brett. Thank you. Okay, so let's get right into chapter 20, Dust on the Wind. So I made a note here that um, dust on the wind is a saying. Yeah. Like in real life. Yeah. Like sort of like to be unnoticed almost. Yeah. Well, there's that song about all we are is dust in the wind. Mm. Are you thinking of colors of the wind? No, no. That's different. That was Pocahontas, right? (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> no, that's every, like every, all we are is dust in the wind. Oh, you know, yeah, yeah. That's okay. all. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Okay. <laughs> anyway, so they're escaping. And then we also have that scary Trolloc skull yeah. picture. And the last time we saw this symbol was when we saw Trollocs like two chapters ago. Right. So chances Probably, are yeah. we know there are Trollocs in this city. Yeah, at least, right? yeah. We know they're trying to escape at night. So not having it. So chances passing, yeah. are there's going to be some interaction. And I'm excited for it. That's a great prediction. So we left the crew just as they were about to leave Shadar Logoth because there are Fades and Trollocs coming right at them. The problem is that they have to leave at night and all the weird shadow people can move around and stuff at night. Yeah, like I suppose the shadows, so. shadows, yeah. I think. We're not really given a whole clarification on what or who or what they can do. Yeah. So. Okay, well, their plan was to leave by daylight so it would be safer, but now they have no other option. Yeah. So. Mad dash. Yeah, so Lan leads the way down the dark, quiet street as icy winds sort of whip around them. And Rand notes that... At least all the Watcher's eyes are gone from the shadows. Yeah. And then he has a scary thought, like, why are they gone? And I think that too. Yeah. Well, at first I thought, like, are they still within the boundaries of that ward that Maureen set up? Or did she, like, pull that ward down? Remember when they first Yeah, I thought the ward was strictly, like, just on the building. Yeah. Because as the boys were running up, it was, like, as they got to the steps of the building, the eyes disappeared. And we also didn't think that it was, like, a movable ward. So it's really, we're not sure why they're they're not there. Yeah. Probably a good reason, right? Like, Mm -hmm. it's probably nothing bad. Probably not. No, nothing bad ever happens to yeah, these no, guys. Everything be, goes yeah. just as planned. It's going to be so, an easy exit. So. Perfect. So as they trot along and they're trying to make as little noise as possible, Rand realizes that they're actually starting to fall behind Lan and Moraine. So as he goes to speed up, he notices this long wisp of fog that's stretching across the road in front of him. And Moraine basically yells, yeah. stop very urgently yeah in like a strangled shout though like she's trying not to shout but she like is shouting because this is very important (laughs) it's like stop yeah (laughs) good one (laughs) loud whisper yell so even the horses seem uneasy about this fog that is continually growing thicker across the road between the group and moraine and lan yeah the only thing i can think is like they fell behind so quickly yeah like so like i think they were really focused on their not making noise yeah that they were like looking at their horses and their horses hooves and each other and they didn't even really notice and all of a sudden when Rand was like shit yeah we're 30 paces behind well, we and it's also s- like everybody on one side and yeah Orion and Lan on the other so yeah so go guys but yeah. anyways too late yeah so as the fog grows thicker Rand notices that there's this sort of like light shining from it and it seems really weird almost like it's alive and Nynaeve asks, what is it? Moraine says that this is the evil of Shadar Logoth. And I think that maybe this is why the eyes and the shadows are gone. Yeah. It, again, it's so not clear as to anything. Mm-hmm. Because last chapter we heard that Mashadar waits still hungering. And that more death was the only thing not consumed by Mashadar. He was snared by it. Mm. So that weird Mordeth guy we just met is somehow connected with yeah. this weird mist. So it's all very vague. Okay. Well, that was just a little theory I had. Yeah. Like maybe the little watcher eyes are like scared of it. Like also don't want to get, you know, eaten up by this weird or fog. Or something. So. Yeah. I have no idea. But yeah. anyway, so Moraine calls it Mashadar. Is that okay? That. Oh yeah. No, that, that's good. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> And says that it is unseeing and unthinking and it moves through the city aimlessly, but if it touches you, you will die. Just dead. Dead. Terrifying. You will get pregnant and die. (laughs) No, just kidding. (laughs) Good reference. (laughs) Die. So, whoa, that's pretty intense. Not just like, oh, you get an infection and you have to cut your hand off. Yeah. It's like, no, it'll (laughs) just just eat you. Yeah. Yeah. So Rand thes about how, you know, the Aes Sedai is sort of like home now and he doesn't like being separated from her. Yeah, I was like, okay, now you want Maureen? Yeah, now like, that you're... Now you're cool with yeah, it? As soon now as you that you're her? essentially being kicked out of the nest. Yeah. Yeah, now it's scary and you want her around. Yeah, we get a couple things about Mashadar too. So it's vast, as vast as Shadar Logoth itself. So it like encompasses the entire city basically. Who knows if it's like underground or what, but it's like lives within and is part of the city yeah and the whole white tower could not kill it 
Yes. So, and if they try to draw in that much power, even if Maureen tries to burn a patch through it, it's going to be like a spotlight yeah. on her well, for the fades. And I just think it's interesting because Egwene, like, asked this question. She's like, how can we rejoin you? And she asked if Moraine can kill it or clear yeah. it away. And I just went, no, Egwene. Like, it's messed, right? Like, she's it already lo- asking, like, she's been asking <laughs> these dumb questions and... I don't know if she just sort of, like, wants attention and is, like, putting her hand up to, like, ask a question just to get an answer. Maybe. Or what she's doing, but no, because if she could have done that, she would have, because she's more rain. Yeah, she doesn't say, need you to suggest things for her to do. Yeah, like, oh, maybe I should, okay, let's do that. Yeah. <laughs> So, so they're pretty much at the mercy of this thing. So Moraine instructs them that they must find another way to rejoin them. So they have to go through the scary city themselves and find a clear street. And then follow the red star to the east toward the river. And that's where they're all going to meet up again. And I really don't like this idea of splitting up. Yeah, but at this point they, didn't really, they don't really have any choice. They have to split up, yeah. go down different paths because they have to reconnect at some point. So yeah, she does at first say she points towards a star. Yeah. Which at first I was thinking, oh, like maybe the North Star because yeah, no, it never not, moves. Though. Yeah. But then she refers it to as a red star. Yeah. Which in my head, the Mars. red star is Mars. Yeah, that's what right? I thought too. Yeah. And I wrote down a couple of funny things about Mars. Can Mars also be seen to the east? Do you think that this is reference to Mars? Like the red star? I don't know if it is. I think that it might be. Just as a as a as a point in the sky for them to go towards, that's easy to see and pretty recognizable, so they can't confuse it. Yeah. But Mars is the Roman god for war, and Mars is the Roman god of war and the agricultural guardian. Yeah. So in Roman history, so he's the guardian of like agriculture, and we're looking at a bunch of farmers here. So I thought it was a nice little parallel. Oh, okay, that's yeah. cute. I thought like god of war, and they're like getting themselves deep in this. War against the Dark One. Well, both. Ooh. Farmers against the Dark One. So. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know if it's actually a reference to Mars, but it might be. Yeah. I just think that... Okay, so they're splitting up, and they're going to go meet, like, down by the river. And yeah. I just think maybe they should have met up, like, outside the gates. Yeah, or I think... Or something like that. Like, why so far? I just don't understand. Like, it was just... It didn't I think make Maureen, sense as a plan. I think Maureen was saying that because Mashadar is so vast, it's hard to say how much and how many streets is covering. So to all meet at the same exit might not even be a possibility. Well, right. But at the same time, to all meet at the same point on the river also isn't a very good possibility. Yeah. I so, mean, we, we do get a little bit more information in a second about that too. Yeah. When she says, you know, I can find you, be assured I can find you. Yeah. So did you have any thoughts as to how? Well, she has a bond with Lan. Yeah. And they can feel each other and sort of sense each other. And so I'm wondering if she sort of put some sort of something. Yeah, you're on the right track. (laughs) Like on them, like some sort of bonding. Now the only thing, and now that you're making me think of this because it's so clear later in this chapter, is those coins. Exactly. So the one thing that we know that's common among the boys at least. Mm, So me yelling at my book later in this chapter. Not so, yeah. (laughs) Is is right. Oh yeah. I'm feeling like that was terrible. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, so there's definitely a likelihood that she put some sort of like magical tracker on the coins and gave them to the boys which would make a lot of sense as to why she's so confident. Like we I never can saw Perrin get one. Do we know? They Perrin talked. Got yeah, one? they talked oh, about they it. Did? Yeah. Okay. They yeah. all got one. And uh, what was it? Ewan or whatever his name was. He got a different coin. Right. Or like it was a, a little bit. But yeah. it was a silver coin. But it made him feel special. Yeah. Right. So probably, and we don't know if Egwene got one. Yeah, or Nynaeve. Or Nynaeve. I doubt Nynaeve did, but I think Egwene could have. Like Maureen could have given her a coin at some point. We just didn't see it. Yeah. Because okay. she clearly had intentions going into that city, into the town. Okay. <laughs> Not city. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I just put a little note here that I just think it's crazy that they're all going to have to go on their own all the way to the river. And I just said, like, Maureen, have you met this group? Oh, yeah. Like, it's still not the best they're plan. They're very but... dumb. They don't pick up on things. They don't take care of themselves. It's bad. But anyways, Maureen reminds them that if this task isn't tricky enough, make no noise because there are Trollocs and four fades lurking around. Okay, see ya. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> and then Moraine says that she'll be able to find them again. So that leads back to sort of the stuff yeah, that you exactly. were just talking about. So the fog is now starting to stretch towards them, and it may be mindless, but it can sense food. 
So that's terrifying. And I guess they're food to the mist. So. Yep. And so Ran looks up and Morhain and Lan are just gone. So the group is clearly nervous because they're being shoved out of the nest here. And no one is really making the first move. So Ran tugs on the reins of Cloud to just sort of make him turn around. But Cloud just starts to trot. And now Ran is the leader and everyone is following him. Yeah. So at this point, I'm starting to think about how they're going to get out of the city because I am convinced that there is going to be something when they try to leave the walls of the city oh, okay. because of the whole more death thing and the treasure. And, yeah. You know, it was just such an odd interaction and Maureen's reaction to the whole thing was kind of odd. And so now I'm more, like worried that they're not with Maureen and Lan when they're going to cross and I think something's going to happen. And that's just all I put at this point in the yeah. chapter. Yeah, and I... to Maureen and Lan, well, Maureen might not think that anything is, you know, amiss on that side because the boys told her that they didn't take anything yeah. and he didn't give them anything and yeah. they didn't do anything for Mordath. Right, so. So she might be a little bit more at ease. And again, they're kind of between a rock and a hard place with options right now. Yeah, okay. So Ran tells himself that he's the leader now and he has to make the others think that he's not afraid. So his inner thoughts are kind of funny here yep. because he thinks you're doing a good job, <laughs> Woolhead. It braids himself a little bit yeah. like, like usual. You'll get everyone out safely. And I said, go around. <laughs> you can do it, maybe. So he convinces himself that he can do this. And just around the next corner is a huge wall of fog with like tentacles reaching out for them. And so they all just turn and gallop away. And then they run into two Trollocs on the road. Yeah. So that was fast. The <laughs> Trollocs seem just as surprised to see them, which is kind of funny. Well, remember, they're terrified as well. Yeah. This is the place where they, everyone died for them. Yeah. So they're trying to be as low-key as possible. Right. So then another pair of Trollocs appear, and another, and another. And they all sort of bump into each other, like not expecting the first ones to have stopped. And they're all shocked at the sight of humans. But their killer instinct kicks in and they charge at the humans who all like, scatter! Yeah. Right? Everybody goes a different direction. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. So now they are all going to be separated, I think, here. Yeah. And so Ran takes off and yells this way. And but all the others the have <laughs> also chosen their own way and have also yelled this way. So they all run in different directions. And they're all being pursued by Trollocs. So Rand has three on his tail, and they're all howling and waving their catch poles at him. And again, clearly more intent on capture. Yes, than with the catch killing. poles. So, which I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Yeah. Like what's actually worse? Well, if you're caught, there's always an option of escape. Yes. If you're killed, that's it. That's yeah, the end. you're done. So, so I mean, capture is better for now, presumably. For now. Okay. Yeah. Now the terrifying thing is that. These Trollocs are matching Cloud stride for stride right now. And we know Cloud is a fast horse. Yes. So Trollocs are fast because they're gigantic. Yeah. So he's running away, but he starts to notice that the uh, Mashadar fog is starting to come out of like building windows yeah. towards him. And then he notices that a Fade has now like joined the Trollocs and is chasing him too. So Ran digs his heels into Cloud and runs on just as the fog tentacles basically like close in behind him. Yeah. And the Cinematic, like and totally yeah. seem like ducking under the fog. So. Yeah, just in time. Yeah. It's like that whole car and railroad tracks. Oh, yeah. Scenario where like you got to beat you the train. You just beat the train, yeah. Yeah, and then the bad guys are stuck on the other side of I, the train. I was, yeah. Except the train is evil and eats you. <laughs> <laughs> it's the worst train. I, I, uh, I had a or thought Or the of... coolest train. I guess so. <laughs> it eats people. If he eats the bad guys. Or you, if you get touched by it. Yeah, so. but he didn't. To be fair, if you get touched by a train. Yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> usually not good, too. So I was thinking Indiana Jones style. Oh, Like yeah. sliding under the door, grabbing your hat. Yes, definitely. So the Trollocs and the Fade slow down as the tentacles reach for them now. And they basically just, like, get enveloped. And yeah. And it's, like, terrifying and it's like killing the Trollocs and the Fade and the Fade like shrieks a crazy scream as oh, it yeah. dies. A piercing whine that dug into Rand's ears with all the fear that could exist. So this is my interesting thought about this. With the TV show coming out, this series is not necessarily super explicit in the violence and the blood and gore. But if the TV show wants it to be, this could be violent gory and horrifying yes it could be yep. but rj doesn't focus on the description of 
the blood and guts. The blood squirted everywhere. And yeah. Yeah, no. But with this, like, the Trolloc opens its mouth to scream, and the fog, like, rolls into his mouth. That's more like Stranger Things. Oh, man. Terrifying. Yeah, exactly. scary. Yeah. yeah. Like, horror movie. Yeah. So, like, they could go on a very horror movie style with it, or they could, you know, back off a little bit, make it more... Yeah, who knows? You know. I hope it's not too scary. I don't like scary. I was going to say make it scary. No, get... I like like <laughs> thrilling adventure, but like it doesn't have to be terrifying but it... Like and give me nightmares. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, this makes Cloud run even faster than ever. And I think it's probably good that Ran ended up getting this crazy fast horse. Yeah. Because he's clearly being like pursued almost the hardest. Yeah, from what we, we can, anyway. that we can see. Also, side note, the Fade that got killed by the fog too. The fade got its head chopped off and it doesn't even die till sundown. Yeah. Right? But the fog just like... It was also, though, nighttime. I wonder oh, if true. the fog got him in the day. If he was... What would happen? Yeah. That's a good point. If he would die right away or... Like, if you chop off fade's head off at nighttime, does he die right away? Yeah, exactly. So. Okay. I... Okay. Good questions. Thank you. Yeah. I like having good points that make you say, oh, good points. Yeah. <laughs> yeah i mean we'll never we will hopefully find out later so ran ends up pulling cloud to a stop here and he can't hear the screams anymore so he finds the red star in the east and wonders if everyone else is still alive to see it and follow it and he thinks about how he wishes that Egwene followed him so that he could have kept her safe and this is a reoccurring theme this chapter for yeah. Rand. So he decides to go to the river on his own after sort of toying with the idea of trying to go around the whole city to like look for everyone. And the thought of searching the vast city of ruins while keeping away from the Trollocs, Fades, Mordeth, and Mashadar yeah. makes him see some reason. Yeah, and I, I'm glad yeah. he has some self-preservation skills. Yeah, I was going to say like the worst thing you can do is everybody go back in the city and look for each other. Like that's the worst plan. Yeah. But... I mean, and Egwene for him, like, I get why he's thinking about her, because up until about, like, a week and a half ago, yeah. I mean, they still like each other, and they were well, promised Min to each other. Well, said they love each other. Yeah. 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 So. So, I mean, there is a definite connection there, but. Yeah. But he makes to go, and then he hears something, and sees a dark shadow, and without really thinking, he lunges at it, and he draws his sword, and suddenly realizes that it's Matt. Yeah. Who was absolutely not ready for any kind of attack, yeah. <laughs> which is pretty bad. Yeah. And he... Like, totally taken by tumbles surprise. Tumbles back and almost falls off his horse and nearly drops his bow. And I said here, now we know why Matt is the only one who was unhorsed while fighting the Trollocs? Yeah, it makes sense because he's not prepared. No. Yeah. He's just, like, surprised and fall... Like, he can't... Yeah. Well, he, and he does his little neck rub again. He doesn't have very good again. reaction yeah. time. He doesn't. He yeah. does his little neck rub again too, which I'm I'm assuming he got the catch pole around his neck at the first encounter. Oh so. yeah, yeah, maybe. Yeah, because he's like that. he's terrified again of the same thing. So yeah, like he's like ah. He needs better reaction time. <laughs> yeah, I think. So I think it's pretty convenient here that Rand runs into Matt and not one of the others, because now we're gonna get to see what happens when Matt tries to leave the walls. And oh with yeah, the for treasure he stole. Like, and then I just view, put yeah. another note that I'm so convinced that something bad is gonna happen with that. Yeah. That, and then now I was just like, oh, because he could have run into Perrin, he could have run into Nynaeve, he could have run oh, into Tom, okay. but he ran into Matt, so that we can see what happens when Matt tries to leave the wall. So that's interesting. So, because I know we had a conversation about, but you do think that Matt swiped something? Yeah, I and do. You do think that? Okay. And I think it's well, I thought. I mean, I've read the chapter. Yeah. But, yeah, it, as I was writing my notes here, like, I was just, you're like... like you, you're dead set I was that. like, oh, easy. Oh, yeah, Matt's going to turn into a terrifying shadow monster right well, now? Well, I didn't know what yeah. was going to happen. Aran was going to have to, like, save him, or maybe... And then I thought maybe, yeah. like, Maureen or Lan would, like, show up just in time. To, like, like, I yeah. really thought this was going to be such a big point okay. in this chapter. That's fun. Because they made the whole more death thing so intense and so creepy and so scary yeah that if it's not going to mean anything like i don't get it or maybe he didn't take anything maybe i know anyways yeah but let's continue yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they take off toward the river and then they get to a big opening where the gate used to be and then here this is what i say so 
Matt hesitates at the gateway. And no. then Rand says, come on, we're no safer in here than we are out there. And I think, oh boy, here we go. So you're, you're thinking Matt's hesitating at the gates because he took something and he's afraid that yeah, he's going to turn something, into like... something or something's yeah. happening and they're really building it up. And I say they really built this up for nothing because they ride away from the city and nothing happens. And I said, dot, 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 that we know of. And so yeah. now I'm thinking like, did okay. he steal his body? And... Now it's like we a mat know. suit. Yeah. Mash or, ma- or more death wearing a mat suit. Yeah. I okay. just, nothing. That was like the most <laughs> wrong prediction I've had so far, I think. <laughs> like just like in, for like immediate gratification yeah, yeah. or immediate, like yeah. just immediate feeling of just like, that was a terrible <laughs> idea. You just saw a lot. Of, okay. I yeah. saw a lot and I tried and I just can't believe there was literally nothing. Yeah. There was okay. nothing to do with it. Yeah. So it was like, okay. We, it's okay. Whatever. So we, we they're riding a, towards the river. We do get the nice little, like, I just keep thinking when Tom's gallop, galloping by yeah. and he says, ride, ride you, you fools. fools. It's like Gandalf in Lord of the Rings when he's like, fly you fools before yeah. he falls into the pit. Yeah. But anyway, so yeah, Tom takes off past them now. And they hear that he is clearly being chased by Trollocs. Yeah. And Ron thinks, like, what the fuck are we going to do once we reach the river without Moraine? Yeah. Like, they're clearly coming up on the river. No plan. So, yeah. So, now we have a nice little group of Tom, Rand, and Matt. Yeah. And I said, yep, good question, Rand. What are you going to do? Yeah. So, we really don't get to find out right now because... dun 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 Perspective change! Yay! So now we only have like 145 left to go. Okay. So this is a little bit weird and I was not expecting this in the middle of a chapter. Yes. Okay. It took me a minute to figure out what was happening. Yeah. And I even looked over at you and went, what? Yeah, I remember that. And I went this in the middle of a chapter and you went, yeah. Yeah. So that's a common theme. (laughs) This will happen lots. Yeah. And the way they do it is they do a little dividing line, like a one blank line empty yeah. line and in the audiobooks it's really difficult because if you're not really paying attention sometimes you miss it oh and then you're like wait a minute yeah. how are we in this person's head now yeah because yeah. on the perspective switch it doesn't always start by saying perrin sat on his horse yeah like sometimes it'll go paragraphs without a name being said yeah and you're like who is this oh see that's <laughs> annoying yeah but anyway so i thought okay well this is interesting and then i thought oh man perrin well, you didn't want to hear from Perrin? He's the most boring one. Like, of all the characters <laughs> I wanted to hear I from. I think you're going to offend so many people right now. Yeah, oh, well, man. he's the worst. <laughs> it's only because he's... Especially he's... in his head. Like, even being in his head, like, made me yawn and go to sleep. <laughs> like... <laughs> So, oh, man. so I thought that this is really interesting, sort of the way it changed scenes, but in the same sort of moment. I just have to come to Perrin's defense. It does get better. Okay, whatever, Brett. <laughs> right now, it's bad. You have okay. to You have to admit, this isn't I, good. I get it. I get it. Like, this isn't good. For you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my god. Okay, gosh. let's talk about Perrin. Yeah. Okay, but no, at first I wanted to say that the whole perspective changing thing, I like, I really like it. It's okay. part of like the style of Game of Thrones writing yeah. that I really like because it lends itself really well to like a show or a movie. Yes, it does. Because when you're watching a show, you're not just following one character the entire time, usually, unless usually. it's a weird show. Yeah. But typically, you get shifts to show where different storylines are happening and yeah. what different things are happening to different characters. And so... I like this style of writing because it feels like you're really getting just such a well-rounded story. Yeah, I 100% agree. And I also love it because then you get to see the like the truths of what each character sees. While you as the viewer get the full scope, you get to see the character and only know what they know for that chapter. Right. And I think that this series does a really good job of like for each character that's written their knowledge base is very limited to what they would actually know yes and that can be for the reader really frustrating sometimes because you can watch a character getting stuff wrong yeah but in their heads they're right yeah and i'm gonna do an impromptu harry potter reference okay which means we'll have to get a shot yeah sure but first you said we only had one for this i know but this one is an impromptu one because i was thinking about in a, reading a book and seeing things from different characters' perspectives because I thought that J.K. Rowling did a really good, interesting job 
of getting Voldemort's perspectives on things okay. through Harry's mind. Uh, okay. So you're almost, because they have whatever... Because they have that connection like or something? Like their soul connection, whatever. Harry gets a lot of insight into what Voldemort is seeing and what Voldemort is doing. And it really comes in handy, especially in the second half of the um, seventh book, mm-hmm. when they it's really important for them to know where Voldemort is and what he's doing and what he's thinking. Yeah. And so he's like spying on his... Right. Okay. But then we get Voldemort's point of view like through the eyes of Harry. So we're still in Harry's perspective, but we also do get that perspective yeah, yeah. shift. And so I thought that that was just sort of like an interesting way around in a story, not actually switching characters. Yeah. Is Harry Potter only from Harry's point of view? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Except for the first chapter when he's a baby. Which is from... Is it from Dumbledore's point of view? Um, weird. I think it's still technically... It's the, it's is a, it like a... Thir- it's a like narrator. A narrative point of view? Because for a while, it's from the Dursley, Uncle Vernon. So it's like a narrative point of view, almost. Yeah, like. but for a while, it's from his point of view, because he go, he notices the owls are really weird, and then okay. he notices weird people on the street while he's at work, and it's from his point of view. Mm. And then he notices the weird cat, and then it shifts... To when it's all dark, and then it's from I think maybe McGonagall or Dumbledore. Yeah, maybe Dumbledore's point of view. When he does a little light put her out. Yeah. Thing. So the first chapter for sure in Harry Potter is not from Harry Potter's. But the rest, but of, the it rest is? of it is. Okay, interesting. Those are just really my only two real fantasy experiences. So. Yeah. Okay. That's good. Okay, time for a shot. Yeah, I think so. All right, I poured them for us. Yeah. So which uh, which shot class do you have? I have Bahamas. And I have London. Ooh, representing. Yeah, and what are we drinking? Uh, Bubblegum vodka. Smells really good. Yeah, smells like bubblegum. Okay, cheers. Cheers. (laughs) Gonna edit out that. No, it makes people know that I really took one. (laughs) In case they're wondering. Okay. Now, where were we after that tangent? Parent. Perrin. Perrin. So now we're in the head of Perrin. Yeah. Which just makes me wonder what is happening with Rand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I want to know. Get used to that. Okay. So Perrin is sitting on his horse, staring at the open gateway. Yeah. Clearly waiting for the others or something. And it turns out he's been sitting here thinking about what to do for, for like, like five minutes. Solid yeah. five minutes, which is a long time when yeah. you're being like pursued by Trollocs and. Oh, All the yeah. stuff's going on. You're just sitting there staring. And we get some interesting insight into Perrin here because yeah. he thinks, you know, he knows everyone thinks that he's slow or dumb, but it's because he's big and he moves carefully. Yeah. And we got an original introduction to that. Yeah. I put that in here. Nice. Yeah. I did. I wrote it. Yeah, I said, when we this first is a callback to Emmonsfield when they were moving through the crowd to see the peddler or something. Yep. And Perrin was very careful to move slowly and not bulldoze anyone over. Yeah, not jostle people, because he's, gi- he's a big guy. He's gigantic afraid of hurting dude. people by accident, yeah. turns out. Which I guess makes sense if he's such a big guy. Like, he's a strong guy. Yeah, yeah. and if he accidentally knocks someone, like, you're going to hurt someone. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I do think it's an interesting perspective, because we've seen so much of Rand and how self-conscious he is, yeah. and he doesn't think very highly of himself. Like, all these different things. Like, he's not a confident yeah. dude. And now we're going to get to see what people, like, Perrin thinks of himself. Right. So, Obviously, yeah. he goes, I know they think I'm dumb, but I'm not. Yeah. He's pretty secure in that. Yeah. And he goes, I just move slower. Like, I know why they think it. Yeah. And he likes to think things all the way through. Because right. quick and careless thinking gets people hurt or in trouble. Yeah. Especially Matt. Yeah. It gets Matt into, yeah. specifically, into very hot water. Sorry. And Matt's quick thinking usually puts Rand and Perrin also into the trouble right along with him. Yeah, I was going to say, are you excited to see what Matt thinks of himself? Yeah, I've always, from the beginning, said I want a Matt perspective. <laughs> yeah. That's going to be my favorite. I'm already calling it. But All right. Because I think he's funny. Although annoying at times because he is so careless. Yeah. He's the opposite of Perrin. But I think that makes for more interesting yeah. reading. Than someone sitting and staring at an opening in a wall. Well, yeah, we saw Matt clearly not even paying attention to his surroundings. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> so he sits here thinking and weighing out all his options because careful thought is the way. Yeah, and he's sitting because he thinks that if he just dashes across, like it's a big span of no hiding place. Yeah. So I think he's just waiting to see if he can see an ambush coming for him. Maybe. So, so 
we get almost a full page of Perrin's back and forth thinking about what he should do. And he considers every single option. And I said, I knew this would be boring. <laughs> because come on, buddy, do something. <laughs> <laughs> but then another figure appears and it hesitantly calls out Rand. And I said, oh, this has to be Egwene. Definitely. And I think it's kind of cute that she's calling to see if it's Rand. Like yeah. she's clearly thinking about him as much as he's thinking about her. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they have a they have a connection. Yeah. So Perrin is very relieved that it's a Gwen and not a Fade. And I, me too. Me yeah. too, me too. <laughs> so plus that means Bella's okay. It does. So good. And then I also just sort of thought about this for a second. And it means that we have heard from all of them escaping the city except for Nynaeve. We do, yes. Okay. So that's where we're sitting at right now. We have the core group, you know, Tom, Matt, and Rand are together. Now Perrin and Egwene are together, and we haven't heard from Nynaeve at all. Yeah. So. And we just assume Moraine and Lan are fine. Yeah. And so I think Perrin has thought about it enough, and especially now that Egwene's there, he has sort of someone else. Yeah. So they take off together towards the river, and Perrin thinks about how it'll be all right once they reach the river, and Moraine and Lan can take care of them again. Yeah. So. As they run through the forest, a trolloc horn sounds in the distance behind them, and some trollocs catch their scent and are quickly right behind them. So Perrin and Egwene take off together, but Bella starts to sort of fall behind. Yeah, this is the worst part. Which seems very scary because Bella, you know, if she can't outrun the trollocs, and Egwene has no real way to defend herself. Yeah. So... That sucks. And then I said, plus, like, she is not really one that they want to catch necessarily. So they also might just kill her. Yeah. Because and if she's not on the catch list, she's on the cooking. Kill. Yeah, eat. kill and eat list. Yeah. So Perrin is yelling for Egwene to hurry. And I just think it's interesting that Bella was able to keep up with the rest of them before when Rand was urging Bella on. Okay. And now, now she can't. Because remember how... Way back ago, I said that it might have been Egwene hmm, and her. Let me think. Yes, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> and so I thought it was like her powers that were like helping Bella. But now I'm thinking it might have more to do with Rand. Okay. I don't know. That's because, an interesting theory. Right. Because why is she falling behind now? Why can't she like... Yeah, because Rand said, you know, light, run, you know, run, Bella. Yeah. Or, yeah, something along those lines. Yeah, when they were running, in his own thought process. When they were going from Emmonsfield to yeah, Taran Ferry. Making that mad dash. Yeah. So Ren definitely had a thought. And, and Perrin, Bella was able to keep up. Yeah. And, and Perrin, Perrin made that comment about, you know, she was able to keep up and I barely had to do anything because it's already, she's good. Yeah. So. Interesting. Okay. But now she's falling behind. So yeah. I just put that as a little interesting note. note okay so i think that perrin should maybe slow down and help like maybe fight them with his battle axe considering that Egwene has no weapon yeah but it's like too late for that because he's accidentally reached the river <laughs> and ran off the cliff yeah it's dark and he just didn't even realize they're at the river yes yeah, so my he's... my most important question here was that if bella's falling behind are we more concerned about bella or are we more concerned about Egwene? And who are they more likely to kill off, Egwene or Bella? Right. Neither at this point. Really? I hope. Well, I don't know. Okay. I was annoyed with you, and I don't <laughs> want you to ever tell me again sure. that we're going to lose characters. Okay. I we're don't want you to do that to me. <laughs> just because then it's in my mind, and it's just like a mind fuck. Because the whole time I was thinking, well, we haven't heard from Nynaeve. Uh, what well, are we going to hear from her? Oh, well, we, you know, we didn't hear from Rand again. We didn't hear from whatever. We don't hear from Egwene again, and I don't like it, and I don't think you should do that to me. Okay. I'm mad at you. Putting you through that? Yeah. So and I haven't been able to talk to you <laughs> about how mad I am yes. that you did that to me, and I don't want you to do it again, okay? The major reason why I said that is because in some series, every single character has plot armor where they won't die for the sake of them being in the story. I get it. I understand. That was why I said that. I get it, but it was... Bad timing, and you know it. Oh, I know it. You was... did it on purpose, and it <laughs> was did. just mean. It was mean. You're mean. Think mean of, boy. Think of it from my point of view. It was really funny to do that. No. Yeah. <laughs> so mean. Well, and I mean, especially considering that after this, we don't hear from Egwene again. So. Yeah. Like, I don't know. I yeah. still actually don't know. Yeah. So I don't want you to say things like that anymore. I can't promise that I won't. Well, I can't promise that we're going to stay married. How about that? <laughs> 
Can we still do the podcast? Yeah, okay. Okay. Might make it less interesting, though. Maybe. Or more, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, whatever. Perrin runs off the cliff into the river. His horse screams, and they fall into the water. So he feels a splash beside him, and he thinks this must have been Egwene, but he reaches the surface and calls for her, and she's not around. Yeah. And then I also think, like, what the hell happened to his horse? I think what happened was he went tumbling off of his horse because maybe the horse tried to do like a fast fast stop or something yeah it's not really clear is who the falls other splash into the, river. the horse it's you, not you clear know. it's not clear okay and i go geez this is just yeah. so intense all of a sudden okay so the trollocs are at the riverbank throwing spears into the water at him and so he's being taken down river and they're following him on the shore so he decides that he has to swim across the river to get away from the Trollocs. And he's having a hard time swimming. Because in, he's got so much gear. In his cloak and boots and everything. And so he eventually takes the cloak off, lets the river have it. He does the whole back and forth about his axe, but he decides oh, yes. not to and get I'm rid of really it. I'm really glad about yeah. that. Because he, he's like, if I get to the other side and I have to fight, like an axe is better than my hands. Right? Yeah, so. and I can only imagine... Yeah. Like having to swim. And then not only like fighting the current. Oh, yeah. Like he's also wearing boots and a coat and has a giant battle axe. Yeah. Trying to pull him under also. But, you know, he makes it struggling like crazy. He eventually makes it to the other side, freezing and so tired. Yeah. And there's still no sign of Egwene or the others over here on this side. Um, But from the other side of the river, he can still hear like the screams of the Trollocs and stuff. But there doesn't seem to be any on this side. So alone, he struggles up the riverbank and finds shelter from the icy wind. Yeah, and that's all we get. Okay. Mm Mm-hmm. So back to Rand. Yeah, back to Rand. And this is why I like perspective switches in the middle of chapters. Yeah. Because you get that really fun back and forth because it does play out like a movie in my head. Yeah, exactly. So that was neat, I said. I'm really happy to hear from Rand, but I'm also really scared for Egwene and Bella. And then I go plus parents, nameless horse. Yeah. And then I guess plus Perrin. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but we know Perrin's okay. What Do you want to throw any predictions out for what happens to Gwen if Bella makes it across, if they both are on the other side, or if they make it to Perrin's side? I'm thinking yeah. in a perfect world, this is where Maureen and Lan sweep in. Okay. As... Egwene is like Egwene's trying to like fight saviors. Them. Yeah, she's trying to fight mm. them off herself. That'd be and really cool. And that that would be like my perfect scenario. Yeah, like she's like got her knife out trying to fight back the Trollocs or whatever, or she's like running or you know upstream when they went because the Trollocs all went downstream following. Yeah, Perrin maybe, and she went the other way, took advantage of that. Okay. And then finds Maureen and Lan. Okay. I'm hoping that'd that's, be a really cool. Scene. That's my prediction. Okay. <laughs> I like that prediction. That's okay. good. Yeah. That's like my perfect Disney version <laughs> of what. <laughs> so Rand, Matt, and Tom seem to have outrun the Trollocs now because the Trollocs can't keep up with their horses. Yeah. They can run as fast as the horses for about 100 paces or so, but they fall back, yeah, which so is good to know. That's good to know about Trollocs is that they're sprinters. Yeah. Right, but the long no distance. No endurance, right. Yeah. So they zigzagged all over the place and lost the Trollocs, but now they've also lost their guiding star. Yeah, mostly so, because there's a lot of trees, trees in the and way. Stuff too. But Tom finds it just as more Trollocs jump out. Yeah, so it turns out they didn't the lose them. So And they take off running again, and Matt gets one of them in the face with an arrow. And I think good reaction time, Matt. Yeah, it's way pretty to good. Go. And then just as Rand and Matt are running towards the river... Rand thinks about how he's not sure it'll do much good to reach the river with the Trollocs so close behind. Yeah, because they're just going to do parent strategy and just ride into the river. Yeah, I guess <laughs> Turns so. Out. But yeah, I'm not really sure. So he realizes here that Tom isn't with them anymore. And he thinks about how Tom must have just gone off his own way, knowing that the Trollocs are really just after the boys. Yeah. So it's like, that's an interesting thought yeah. too. Like that's how much he doesn't trust Tom either. Yeah, I mean, considering that they've confided in Tom, yeah, like they have kind of taken Tom as the more trustworthy of the Moraine land. Tom, that's you know, true. Uh, as the three adults in the situation, so. But I mean, really quickly, we find out Tom nope. did not. Tom had fallen behind yeah. to catch the Trollocs off guard and surprise attack them from behind. So he takes down three Trollocs. Ninja throwing skills. Yeah. So this is the thing I was going to bring up too, because when they were trying to intimidate 
the high tower guy and his pullers haulers haulers right tom was doing the knife tricks and you know flicking them across his hands and stuff like that yeah and that's when maureen gave out that delighted laugh and everything like that yeah and i'd ask you you know does tom actually have knife skills or is he just a performer yeah turns out he's got some skills oh yeah mad ninja skills oh yeah and so he gets them well he throws them and he gets two of them and he gets a third one running away but it like keeps running away so he doesn't like fatal attack that one and I think, like, crazy. And then he goes, oh, man, my second best knives. Yeah. But he makes no attempt to go get them. And he doesn't use his best knives for these trucks. True. Okay. <laughs> so Tom has some pretty good skills here, I say. Yeah, but, definitely. Um, so he says that the one that ran away will definitely get more. So they set off towards the river, and then they find it. And Rand notes that they can't see the other side at all, which tells you how far Perrin swam. Yeah. Or how far up or down river that would have been. Like, I'm not sure where Perrin ran off the cliff. It's like in a narrow section of river. Like, you're not sure, right? Yeah, it's really hard to say. And it's interesting that we got this perspective shift because, like, how much time has passed between these events. Mm -hmm. You're not, you know, it's... It's unsure. It's all, yeah, they they make it very unclear here. So So Rand even thinks, like, I'll swim across if I have to. And so they choose to head downriver, but they have no idea where Maureen is. Yeah, just from a map perspective, it makes sense to head downriver. I said that. Downriver seems logical because they will at least eventually come to Whitebridge. Yes, yeah. And if you look at the map, it's literally, that's, because there's nothing to the north. Yeah. Like, if you go upriver, there's nothing for, until you're in the borderlands, basically. Mm Mm-hmm. So they continue along for a while, actually, with no sign of Trollocs. And then they come to a large trading boat. Yeah. And Tom is very smug about this, saying, now that's better than an Aes Sedai raft. And he's not wrong. No. So he says that typically captains don't like horses on the boats, but just let him do the talking and bring your saddlebags just in case. Yeah, and we know that Tom just gave an instruction to do all the talking, and we also know that the boys are the worst at following instructions. Yes. They are the worst. they also love talking. They do like talking. Ugh. And Rand likes telling people where they're going, and Matt likes telling... What they're doing, (laughs) and all the stuff they have, and giving away all of their money. (laughs) Oh, yeah. It's it's kind of funny, because it's expected at this point, too. It's so bad. Yeah. It's so bad. Like, this is the part in the chapter where I just get, like, angry. Yeah. Like, it's just so, so stupid. Oh, yeah. Like, predictably <laughs> bad. So. <laughs> but I can also, the funny part, of it's predictably bad, but it's predictable because we've gotten so many highlights of what Rand and Matt are like. Yeah. That it's like, it falls right in line with her character. Yep. Yeah. So, as they dismount and they start to approach this boat, Rand is concerned because Tom is clearly implying to leave without the others. Yeah. And Rand doesn't like that. But then he has no time to think about it because Trollocs lunge out and attack again. Yeah. So Tom sprints to the boat, yelling to the crew to wake up. There are Trollocs. And Rand hurls his bags over the side and vaults over the edge, landing right on a guy who had been abruptly woken from his sleep. Yeah, so clearly he was sleeping on the deck there. Yeah. Shouts start coming from all over the boat and Trollocs start trying to climb over the side. Like this is just chaos scene. So Rand is quick with his sword and starts to swing it down and so that the Trolloc falls away. And you know what? No matter how much Rand says he's not good with his sword, he's yeah. getting better. Oh, yeah. Like way here he drew his sword and slashed at a Trolloc and hit it and got it to let go. Yeah. Like he's getting better skill-wise. Yeah. So men are sort of everywhere trying to get the boat away from the shore and a Trolloc made it on board and like three guys are fighting it. And somewhere Matt... Is like loosing arrows from the bow. It could be Matt. It could be some of the guys on the boat right, as well. Right, because we haven't heard that Matt made it on the boat, but then eventually things yeah. calm down and Matt's there. That guy that Rand landed on is all scared. <laughs> and he hilarious. goes, spare me, spare me, take everything, take the boat, spare me. Yeah, that's and awesome. And Rand gets hit from behind by something that makes him fall forward Yeah, and drop his sword. So I don't know if it's a Trolloc or... If it's like people running by or something like smacks him. Yeah, it seems like it might be a troll like hitting him in the back, but it's like maybe with the catch pole. Yeah, or... but as Rand is trying to scramble and get his sword, a troll is now standing up over him about to like spear him. Yeah, because it says with the broken shaft of the catch pole. Yeah. So maybe the troll like hit him with the catch pole 
it broke in half yeah. and then he's gonna make sense because she like with it. gets winded can barely yeah. move like can't get up he got yeah. hit, hit really hard he got there. rocked so ran notes that everything seems to be like moving in slow motion and it's another incident of ran sort of giving in thinking that he's about to die yeah when a boom swings across the boat and knocks a trollic square in the chest and overboard. And Ran thinks that his luck is sure going to run out after this. Yeah, because that could not possibly get any more lucky than that. Yeah, so. that was pretty lucky. Yeah. So the boat is pulling away from the shore, and the trollic screams are becoming more distant. And a man, who is clearly the captain, comes out now. Yeah that everything is a bit more calm on the boat and he yells for a man named gleb gelb oh yeah i like gleb way better <laughs> in my notes i wrote gleb yeah gelb. so this is this I like is the gleb. Tr- i'm gonna call him gleb oh don't do that <laughs> <laughs> that's like your dad saying we should give everybody new names like that would make it he way more confusing remembering, okay oh man <laughs> so this ship captain is a traditional pirate yeah, I was going to say... Where do you be, Gelb? Oh, see, I read it more like a Newfie accent. Like a maritime fisherman. Okay, yeah. Like my mom. I get that. <laughs> oh, man, you wouldn't understand anything. Yeah, especially <laughs> if you go back to Newfoundland and like, meet my yeah. aunts and Or it's like when your mom comes back from Newfoundland after a week. Yes, yeah. and you're like, I don't know what you're saying. <laughs> you're talking way too fast. <laughs> That's what it reminds me of, like a maritime fisherman, not maybe, like a pirate. Maybe Newfies are all pirates. Oh, Fun fact. Yeah, fun fact. In <laughs> Canada, people from Newfoundland are pirates. Right. <laughs> yeah. And we can say that because your mom's from Newfoundland. Yeah, I wrote in my notes. I can say that because my mom's a Newfie. <laughs> yeah. That's so funny. Is that allowed? <laughs> yes, it's allowed. It's totally cool. <laughs> okay. So the man who Rand landed on yeah. comes out from the shadows and this is Gleb. Gelb. Gelb. <laughs> and my whole notes say Gleb the whole way down. So that's, Okay, that's going to be a problem. It's going to be really bad and you're just going to have to deal with it. The captain yells at him, saying that he told him to secure the boom. And Gelb yeah. is super surprised. And he says he did. He tied it tight. And he tells Captain Domon. Domon yeah, Domon. Domon. That, you know, he might be slow, but he gets what he's told to do done. Yeah, but apparently also not, because he was <laughs> supposed to be on watch. Yeah, but this is interesting. Okay. This is right. You have an interesting point? Well, Rand did this. What do you mean Rand did this? Okay, so this is my other Harry Potter reference that I was talking about. Okay. So, in Harry Potter, when witches and wizards don't really know that they're wizards yet, yeah. or they're too young to have formal wizard training, Sure. Like, it's their first coming into their powers. Yeah. So they can, like, make things happen unintentionally. Like have the glass on a snake cage disappear? That's right. Or if they're angry or scared, they can sort of, like, make things happen. Like, mm. when Harry's getting chased by bullies, he, he like, jumps so high that he, like, lands on the school roof. Okay. That kind of thing. So it's, like, to avoid danger, he can do unintentional magic. Okay. So you think that Gelb did, in fact, tie the boom down. Yep. And Ran being in danger made the boom come un- untied yeah. and swung out and crushed the Trolloc that was just about to kill him. Yes. So Gelb is legitimately surprised when yes. Doman says, I thought you tied it down. And he yes. says, I did tie it down. 100%. Okay. Definitely. And especially because Ran is like, everything's moving in slow motion, man. And that's sort of like how... <laughs> that's how you do magic, probably. That's sort of like kind of what it was Sorry, like. Sorry, we should start saying important. channeling. That's how you channel. Yeah, I know. People don't like when I say magic. But But you know what? It's a system of magic. It is. Yeah. But I'll work on it. But anyways, I'm saying this is for sure what happened to Rand, and it's shots time. And that is a prediction we can put on the record then? Oh, yeah. It's like not even a prediction because I know it's... That's what happened. Okay. I'm so confident. confident. Like, come on. You were pretty confident with the whole map thing. Oh, yeah. That was bad. So... But this one's different. (laughs) Okay. This one's different. Okay. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> Shake that one off. So apparently, Gleb, Gelb. Gelb. Which Gelb. one is it? Gelb. <laughs> it's going to get even Whatever, worse. Whatever's this not This is going to get notes. way worse before it gets better. Okay. So Gelb was supposed to be standing watch, but went to sleep instead. And he blames Rand for sneaking up on him, hitting him with a club, and saying that he's a dark friend in leagues with the Trollocs. Yeah. 
I think this is a pretty good lie for a guy who's a little slow. I mean, he's coming up with it on the spot, so yeah. it's not the worst. So, But it's clearly not good enough because Captain Doman does not buy it and yeah. says, Yeah, in leagues with my aged grandmother. He has the best lines about his family. Yeah. So the captain sends Galb off and says that the Trollocs have been following him and he wants them to let him be. Which yeah. is, like, interesting. I yeah, I mean, it's kind of a... I mean, looking at the map here, so Domin is wondering why the Trollocs are following him. Clearly, these Trollocs are not the ones after Domin. Yeah. But we also know that Domin was coming from the north, from Saldea, because he mentions that later on, that he winters in Saldea in the Borderlands. And previously, we had heard that they were told that there's trouble in Gildan and there's trouble in Saldea, Saldea. Yeah. which is where he just came from. That's right. So possibly... Trollocs have been like following him down river for whatever reason like I don't know why but yeah unless he's just accidentally caught up like in the path of, of these the Trollocs, Trollocs coming yeah. down yeah because Moraine thinks it's interesting that all these Trollocs made it down unnoticed so it could just be coincidence but like maybe they weren't so unnoticed yeah maybe people did notice all these Trollocs coming down but did nothing about it like because, this guy yeah for example yeah because what is he realistically what's he gonna do besides yeah. be like oh they must be chasing me yeah, so Rand actually looks over and realizes how far they've come from shore, and he says they have to go back for their friends on the bank, and they will have to pick him up, and he tells them that yeah. he'll, they'll be rewarded. Yeah, not going to happen. Well, he would be rewarded. Probably. Land has tons of gold. Oh, yeah, but, but not no. for Domin. The captain says, <laughs> no, they should go down below and speak in the cabin of such matters so they head down and he says his name is bail yeah domin and he's the captain of the spray yeah so he wants to know why they're out in the middle of nowhere and why he shouldn't throw them over the side for causing him such trouble tonight yeah so matt starts up right away by saying we didn't mean to cause you any trouble we're just on our way to camelin and then and it's like yeah. no <laughs> idiot shut just shut it Shut up. Shut it. Remember when Tom said, let me do the talking? This is the part where you should let Tom do the talking. Well, and Tom cuts him off, saving their butts again, because Tom was the one who stopped Matt from talking in that bath house. Yes. Yeah. And so he cuts him off again, because Matt doesn't know how to listen or how to lie. Yeah. Like, it'd be one thing if Matt could lie really well. But he doesn't. But he, he doesn't. Tells, he doesn't He tells lie. the truth. Yeah. Straight up truth. We're going to Tar Valley, and he tells the scary shadow man. Yeah. God damn. Jeez, why? Anyways. So, <laughs> yeah, so Matt says we're going to Camelin, and then, and then Tom steps in and says, and then wherever the wind takes us. That's how a gleeman travels, like dust on the wind. And I think, ah, the chapter title. Yeah, I like makes sense. that when that happens. Yeah. So Tom introduces himself and says that these two want to be his apprentices, though he's not sure he wants them. And Ron looks over at Matt and Matt's just like grinning because he thinks this is so funny. It's Matt almost... has, a, yeah, he has a hard time catching on to things. Yeah, but it's almost like he likes these stories being told about him. And it's like a real adventure pretending to be someone you're not. Yeah. And maybe eventually he's going to get like really good at telling these lies because he's such a prankster and a trickster. Yeah. And Matt thinks it's really funny and he's enjoying himself anyway. Mm -hmm. So Tom tells this whole elaborate story about how they came down from the mountains and were trying to find treasures of the lost city of Erid Hall. And they came across these dark creatures along the way. And according to Tom's story, they had escaped the city, but they were being pursued by Trollocs and they sought refuge on Captain Domin's most welcome ship. Yeah. And I now, thought, nice touch. The story that Tom tells is kind of interesting because he does put a lot of truths into the story. He tells about the Fades, the Trollocs, Mordeth, Mashadar, the fact that they were in Eridol. The yeah, yeah, so he tells a story that's woven with all these truths, which makes it easier to believe because we previously had a conversation with the best lies are ones told with truths. Yeah. But the important factor is that Tom is really focusing this story that he's the center of attention here. Oh, yeah. He's the one who saved them all. Oh, yeah. He yeah, did everything totally. and he's the reason why they were all, you know, being chased and well, everything. he can't exactly explain that there was a bunch of crazy eyes. Yeah. I, I was going to say magic, but now I'm really <laughs> conscious of saying magic. <laughs> I mean, and for Tom, it is smart to draw, uh, to draw attention away from the boys. But again, there's not really a reason why 
the boys would be the center of attention. Yeah. So, I mean, he's a gleeman also. So storytelling is his... It's his gem. Yeah. So the captain is actually more concerned about whether or not they have the treasure with them. Yeah. And Tom says that it's with their horses that bolted at the sight of the Trollocs. And I really hope that this part is true because I'm actually quite concerned. About the horses? About Cloud, specifically. Okay. And the other nameless horses. Yeah. I, I thought they probably got eaten by Trollocs. They might have. But he says they bolted. They might have bolted. So I'm hoping that's what happened. I'm being positive here. Okay. So the captain wants to be paid for their passage on his boat. And Tom says that he only has his instruments with him and a few coppers. But... You got to do the Bale Dolman accent now. Oh. I know, let me own brother sail with me if you can all pay his passage. Oh, nice. See, that's more pirate. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I always think of Bale Dolman as a pirate. <laughs> no, that's funny. Okay. But the boys are idiots, and they pipe up right away, showing just sort of how green they are. Oh, yeah. And how they just don't know how to interact. Yeah. They're and like, I here's said, all the money in my pocket. Is this yeah. good? Yeah. And so I said, this is like the people who, like, you know when you go to Mexico? Yeah, and pay for stuff on the beach. And you pay for stuff. But it's like the people who just, like, pay full price right away. Yeah. Or like when you go to a garage sale. Yeah, that's and you true. you like, pay full price. That yeah. they're asking. It's like the price is hiked up because they know that you're going to barter. Yeah. And if you pay full price. You're an idiot. <laughs> sort of. Yeah. Well, you're losing money you could have You're not saved. paying what you could have spent, which right. is less. If you're concerned about saving money, which yeah. is clearly what Tom was concerned about here. Yeah. You shouldn't offer up all the money you have. At the very beginning. Right. Yeah. But I think here what happens is Rand gets... A little bit thrown off because Domin mentions his sword. Yeah, he's eyeing it. And Rand is like, no fucking way. Yeah. You don't get this sword. This is my dad's sword, okay? Can't have it. <laughs> so he empties his pockets. And then Matt doesn't really want to, but he reluctantly does the same. And they both come up with a couple coppers and the silver coin that Moraine had given them. And this is really important because... Well, I actually think I shouted no at my book here. Yeah. Because if this is, like what we discussed before, if this is actually sort of the way for her to keep tabs on them. Yeah. Like she can keep tabs on them as long as they're on this boat. Yeah. But then she's going to be keeping tabs on fucking Captain Domin. Yeah. And so, then wild goose chase chasing this boatman if they get off somewhere else. Oh my god. Yeah. Because when I read this, like it, that that didn't even cross my mind. I knew it was bad. Yeah. I knew it was a terrible idea. Don't get I, rid of that one thing that I said I gave you specifically. Specifically. Yeah. And all three boys the same thing. Yeah. So. Yeah. We're just going to give it away. And it's clearly a lot of money. Because they get silver back and coppers. Yes. Tom thinks they're being overcharged, but... For sure. Well, they yeah. are. Well, but yeah. it's also the fact that it's the Aes Sedai coins yeah. that you're giving away. So it's like a big hefty silver mark. So. Yeah. So I'm sure Moraine didn't give it to them to use as payment on a ship. Yeah. That's all I wrote. Like, I don't know. At this point, when I was reading, I didn't know what it was for. Yeah. I knew it was important, and I knew she didn't give it to them for literally Just nothing. spending money. <laughs> yeah, it's not spending money, stupids. Yeah. So Tom glares at them, but it quickly becomes a smile. And though he grumbles that it being too much money for passage only to Whitebridge. Mm -hmm. And Domin says that it's also for the damage to this ship. Ah, yes. The incidentals. And I guess they just don't have, like, credit cards to put a deposit on. Yeah, probably not. Mm, shoot. I mean, to be fair, at least he gave them some silver back. Yeah. Like, when reading that, he could have just taken it and been like, yeah, that's passage. Yeah. Cool, thanks. No change. Sorry. Yeah. Don't have change, but... But that's not the point. Bail Domin, be a reasonable man. Sure. Yeah. So Rand pipes up here, being too concerned about the others, and says that he should take the others too. They should have reached the shore by now. And Domin says, no way, man. We're already four miles away from where you came aboard, and I'm not going near that shore again. I've already had too many run-ins with those trollics. Yeah. But it's interesting. So... I thought he was going to be like, what do you mean the others? Your story said it was just the three of you. But I went back and I reread the story. Mm -hmm. And it said he set out with a few companions, yeah. including these two. Yeah. So never mind. Yeah. Tom's good at storytelling. Yeah. He's so, got his base covered. Yeah. So Tom wants to know when Domin encountered Trollocs before. And then this is when he says that he had to winter in Saldea yeah. because the winter froze early. And like he didn't want to winter up there. So yeah. too bad. We do get some really inform important information here. 
So we get the fact that the Blight is especially bad right now. And there's like Trolloc raids every night. Whole villages are being like engulfed in flame. So the Borderlands are way worse than they normally are. And then that is leading to rumors saying that the Dark One is stirring and the last days are coming. Mm, so ominous. Very ominous, yeah. So Domin doesn't like this at all and wants to get back south where the tales of Trollocs are just that, tales and traveler's lies. Yeah, because apparently if you're like south of Andor, like Emmons yeah. Field and stuff, they don't even think Trollocs exist. Yeah. So as Domin is sort of telling this story, Rand thinks about Egwene, how she's on the shore and he's safely on this boat and how he feels guilty and he's it's not fair. But then he's interrupted by Tom, who's ushering them out of the captain's cabin. And so when they're back up on the deck, Tom is all pissed off because he could, could have gotten passage for a few coppers and some songs. Yeah. And so Rand stares over the side of the boat, but all he can see is black, not even the riverbank. And he thinks about how he told Egwene he would take care of her and how he should have tried harder. Mm-hmm. He should have tried harder. Come on, Rand. I don't really know. He should have was... fought off all the Trollocs and fought off Mordeth and Mashador by himself. Come on. Yeah, well. In his mind, he, maybe. <laughs> he kind of feels like he should have. So. Yeah, maybe in like six books. <laughs> I don't yeah, know. maybe. I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> so that's the end of this chapter. Yeah. And I say here, like, so what of Egwene and Bella? What of Nynaeve? Mm-hmm. What of Moraine and Lan? And then Perrin is freezing to death by himself over there. Yeah, it turns out on the other side of the river. Yeah. So we have Tom, Rand, Matt going downriver towards Whitebridge now, which was... And potentially giving away their GPS. Yes, potentially, if that is how... Right. Turns out that's how she's going to locate them. And we really don't get anything else. Which is why I have to keep reading. Yeah, yeah. And I'm really excited because next episode we're going to be covering two chapters. Yeah, yeah. So we'll get to get through a little bit more. Right. But do you have anything to wrap up this chapter with? Any of your thoughts? Any questions for me? So maybe not questions, but I just want to clarify your opinion. Okay. So you're pretty sure that Rand did some magicking to make that channeling. boom. Channeling. Channeling. Yes. To make that boom swing out and hit that trollic? Yeah, I don't think he did anything on purpose, though. Okay. He didn't do anything intentionally. So kind of like that yeah. first touching of the power as right. it were and there are some other instances that i can't remember specifically right now yeah of him talking about his good luck okay and so now i'm curious about all of those times as well okay because you mentioned the whole bella thing about maybe it had more to do with him than it had to do right with and Egwene it's becoming or... more obvious that he's able to do some kind of channeling okay which I mean, is kind of scary considering what the fate of men who can channel yeah. typically is, right? My my biggest counterpoint to that, I would suppose, would have to be the fact that Egwene's first touching of the source was her doing a small flicker of light with a stone with Maureen's help. Yes. And Rand... But who knows what Egwene has done unintentionally oh, good point. on okay. her own. Like if she's having a pre-witch, pre-wizard... Yeah. Experience where like Harry gets a bad haircut and it grows back <laughs> the next day. Oh, did that happen? Yeah. Okay. There's lots of instances. <laughs> you know what? Honestly, or that'd he has be a, a really, really <laughs> ugly hand me down sweater. Yeah. And the neck hole shrinks so he can't get it on. Or like or the whole sweater shrinks so now he can't wear it. I was gonna say that haircut thing would be pretty pretty useful. If it's a bad hair no, but because he's got a big mop of hair <laughs> and they tried to cut it all off and then the next day it was all grown back. Uh, okay. So, but. Yeah, so we don't we don't get a lot of clarification on what's actually happening here, but. Yeah, because who knows what Egwene has also done. Yeah, sort unintentionally. Of unintentionally, or, accidentally, or if it works like that for If it's the women same for women men, and men, yeah. Because women sort of have a path to follow. Yeah, there are clear differences so far in the power that they're using. Yes. But we don't really know much else about the power setting besides their, you know, different strengths and different elements. Yeah. So it's hard to say at this point with the limited information. Right. But I can say that for something like that happening unintentionally, I don't think it was an accident. So. Okay. And then the second point was with Matt. I know you were really concerned about something happening, mm-hmm. but maybe he wasn't the one to take something. I just wanted to think, ask if you had any ideas of if somebody else 
Like swipe Rand something. or Perrin? Yeah. No, I don't. Or Egwene or Nynaeve. Well, Egwene and Nynaeve. We know they didn't necessarily there. sneak off, but. And didn't encounter more death at all. Correct. So, no, I don't so think an, so. Yeah, unintentionally. I think, I think this is the thing where you're trying to lead me off the scent a little bit. Okay. But I think the fact that there was a clear mention of daggers with gems in the hilt in that room, and there was a clear mention of Matt really wanting the dagger, or really wanting the treasure, sorry. Yeah. And then there was also mention of him grabbing a dagger yeah. to defend himself with. And then when they got out of the place, he sort of said, at least I, and then didn't say anything else. And then he hesitates at the gate. Yeah, I don't know if he's smart enough. I don't know if he's hesitating about that. Okay. That's what I read into. Sure, yeah. I was just wondering because you said you're kind of, okay, so would it have happened I think it might come else, back so. to him. I think, I don't know if we're done with it. I yeah. think that was a huge thing for us to learn about. Yeah. To just like never come back to again same with like the white cloaks yeah that encounter with the white cloaks do i think this is the last time they're ever going to encounter bornhold yeah definitely not probably because he was a major dick oh yeah and for sure after that i said i magic i'd say probably if they all make it to white bridge i'd say the white cloaks are probably riding like waiting for them or to like find them and try to kill her right yeah so i don't think we're introduced to things to just never hear about it again yeah So I think that's a good point. Even though it didn't come to fruition, this chapter, like the next chapter, that doesn't mean that it's not going to come back at all, I think. Okay, I like that. I guess it's time to keep reading into the next chapter then. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Yes. Two chapters. Yeah. Oh, I get two chapters. Yeah. (laughs) I get to finish reading a chapter and then read the next one. Except the next one, chapter 22 is only like five pages or something like that. But it's still exciting. It's all exciting. I'm so excited about all of this. Good. So it's good. So I was going to say that. It's all part of the pattern now. Yeah, it must be. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Wheel Weaves. If you'd like bonus content, exclusive insider looks, and to support us making great content, you can find us on patreon.com slash the wheel weaves podcast. Please feel free to rate, comment, and subscribe. It would really mean a lot to us and does actually make a really big difference. Tell your friends or anyone who might like us or anyone who's thinking of getting into the series who might want to follow along with us. You can find us on social media. There's more information on there and some fun pictures and tidbits on Instagram at The Wheel Weaves Podcast or on Twitter at The Wheel Weaves Podcast. Thanks, as always, to Audionautics.com for the music and thanks to you awesome listeners.